Hi, welcome to NDE TV. I'm Peggy Robinson. Today's guest is Laura Ketchrich. Did I say it right, Laura? Laura Ketchledge. <laughs> I practice. I still <laughs> messed it up. Thank you. <laughs> no worries. And your near-death experience was in 1979? Yes, it was. So I here was I graduated high school. <laughs> I was 19 years old then, yes. Okay. So I'll let you go ahead and tell us your story. Well, I'd like to take the listeners okay. back to 1979. Okay. It was a time before the Internet, before discussion about near-death experience, um, and anything peril, uh, paranormal or uh, out of body was considered mental illness, to say the least. So I was not prepared for what was to happen that day. It was a beautiful spring day and I went horseback riding. I mean, I've ridden horses since I was a little girl. I'm not the best rider. I've never had a good sense of balance, but I took out a horse that was above my ability. And I think that's where my problem started. I didn't want the gentle horse. I wanted the fast, slick horse. So what I was doing was I was riding this horse very fast with two other gentlemen behind me and the horse just took off in a lightning hand gallop and the problem was uh the horse was going so fast he stumbled into uh what's a gopher hole so when his foot went down you know he just kind of like peered down and i went flying i knew i was going to get hurt really badly um i knew the accident was coming and it was sort of in slow motion but i never hit the ground peg I left my body before I had that horrid impact. I was wearing a riding helmet and boots. I was doing everything correctly, except I was going too fast and it was my own darn fault. So what happened was, uh, it's hard to describe sometimes the most powerful event of your life because it's imprinted in your mind. It, it, it's like it happened last week. It was the most powerful experience that I've ever had. Um, the first thing I wanna say is one minute I was looking um, over the horse and seeing that I was going to be going head first into rocks. The next minute like that, like a light switch, I was in a black velvet tunnel. And I don't know how I got there. I literally left my physical body, my spirit, soul, or whatever astral, second body you want to call it the me that was me went into this tunnel and it was very very instantaneous it almost felt natural there was not an unwinding or an apprehension it just was like like that so when i went into the tunnel i knew that I was not in um, the physical world anymore. I knew that I was somewhere else. I thought, I'm dead. And I was 19 and I had just begun to live. So that roller coaster of emotion was almost like vomiting. I mean, the whole upheaval of your mind, just knowing that you're here once and it's like being you know what if someone just transported you into the middle of the atlantic ocean in the middle of the night and just dropped you plop in the ocean that's how abrupt it was so i was going at a good rate of speed and there was um a purpose to this experience now i found my grandfather and he had died when I was 12 and I just adored him. He was just wonderful. And it was a very, uh, you know, I hadn't seen him since I was 12. You I'm say you to... found him. Yes. In the tunnel. He found me as I exited the tunnel. I'm sorry. Um, then we went on this tremendous review of my life. It was a long, um a long experience it felt like you know like a day or so or two it wasn't the you know the few minutes that i was dead the time there and the time in physical reality are two separate things 
Now, I know I went over my life. It wasn't the best feeling. It wasn't a good feeling um, because uh, I'm dyslexic. So I really struggled in school. I mean, terribly. And I was undiagnosed dyslexic. So I had a terrible time in school coping. And then when I would come home, my father would just scream at me about uh, grades and college and success. Uh, Dad had uh, uh, um, two volumes loud and louder when he yelled. <laughs> uh, it wasn't this wonderful, like rejoicing. I, I did this when I was 12. I did this when I was 11. It was kind of a sad review of my life. Was it of the hurts you've had? Of the hurts I dished out. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Basically, when you die, you review your own life. You're your own worst critic. And uh, it's hard to express because it was so emotional and intense. But let me get to the part that I think is the most interesting. Okay. Um, the most interesting, um, what I call a source, you know, everybody says, you, see, you, you know, they go through the, the tunnel and they go through their past lives and, you know, things like that. I went to a place where all of my personalities were collected. All of the versions of me that lived in physical reality throughout time. There was like a lineup of all the women I'd been. There was a lineup of all the males I'd been, you know, human beings, of course. It was like in this corridor and I got to see that I, I didn't really believe, I mean, I mean a, I'm a minister's granddaughter. We didn't cover reincarnation in church. Okay. Um, there was a lot, I've done this before. I've done this before in physical reality a lot of times. So that was pretty shaking. Uh, your whole core values switch. Sometimes I'm not a good explainer pick. So I'm in this beautiful, beautiful cascading, white, cloudy sea of love. And I go into this corridor and I see that I've lived as a woman and as a man many times, at least 50 on each. And I even went to touch one of the other um, uh, souls or aspects of myself. And I saw a man's face and I went on the other side and touched. I saw a female's face. She wasn't too pretty. Uh, and I was just in awe. I've done this before. You know, reincarnation was very foreign to me, that thought. So going to source and seeing these different personalities, it was unbelievable. And what source really is, is you your own soul the many aspects of you um people might say it's heaven i didn't have a religious experience i had a spiritual realization there's a big difference you know i was a uh, granddaughter of a, a presbyterian minister so and i went to bible school and i had all this christian upbringing and that just kind of flew out the window and instead, what was replaced was just an understanding that there is source and feeling that unconditional love, like you're wrapped in a sea of love and it's blissful. And there was like music floating through like in random waves, waves of music. And it was timeless and it was beautiful, but I didn't get to stay there. You wanted to? Oh yeah. Yeah. And you kind of, I kind of got sucked back to another level where my grandfather was. And I was saying, this has taken so long, this past life's review. So I've you been, saw him in the tunnel and then didn't see him during the review. And then you saw him again. Yeah. 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 And another layer or another, I'll get to that later. Okay. What I figured out some of these things were. So, I'm talking to my grandfather, not wanting to leave him, but I always, I had a lot of anguish and I'll tell you what my anguish was. I wanted, I had this urgency to get back to physical reality and get my life right. Fix it. Fix the broken pieces, which I've been trying to do for the last 40 years. Fix the broken pieces, be a better person. Um, and my grandfather, oh, 
he had the bluest eyes and he had very large hands. So when my hand was in him as my adult hand that was white, was in his hand, he had a very large hand. And I asked my mother later after I related this and she said, yeah, Papa had very large hands because when you're a little kid and all the adults have large hands. So I was really checking out his hands. And as I was getting sucked back into my body, it's like um, the opposite of a cork getting pulled out, you know, a bottle of wine. It was pretty, pretty surreal. I was leaving him and it wasn't my choice. I had no control whatsoever about what was going on through this whole experience. Um, and didn't, wouldn't have even known the right questions to ask at the time. So when I was coming back, I'm back in my body. These guys have resuscitated me. I look around this field, it's this gorgeous field and the horse is off in the distance. And my first thought, this is not reality. And I wasn't in a good mood. I wasn't gracious. I wasn't mean or bitchy, but I wasn't really gracious because I'd been very, very, very uh, traumatized by this. And what happened next is um, the two gentlemen that were riding with me, I didn't even know their names. These guys were my heroes. Not only did they resuscitate me, get into my purse, call my mother, tell her to go to Fairfax Hospital in Virginia, they drove me to the hospital. They didn't wait for an ambulance. And they got me in the back seat of the car. And these poor guys were young guys in their 20s. And I mean, they were like terrified I was going to die. <laughs> they were so upset. And I'm sitting there and I was thinking, this isn't right. This isn't right. I'm, I'm not supposed to be here. I got to get out. I got to go. I got to go back. I got to go back. I got to go back. And then I passed out. But I didn't leave my body or have a second death experience or anything. I passed out and remember waking up like, where am I? Where am I? There's these two strangers in the car. So we're going from Centerville, Virginia to Fairfax Hospital. I get in the hospital. I don't think I look too good. I mean, my finger was broken and my nose was broken and I was a giant swollen bruise from head to toe. And, um, you know, my hair looked like buckwheat in three different directions. So did you hit those rocks? Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, I did. <laughs> I Head said, first, it, huh? it wasn't pretty. Would you like to hear what happens next? Sure. Okay. So I get into the ER and um, and I tell the doctor, I, I really got hurt. <laughs> you know, I'm really hurt. I'm really hurt. And my mother comes in there. She's an RN. She's like, oh my God, oh my God. You know, uh, she was half expecting me to be dead. And I, I, I looked at her and I said, I said to her, I said, you know, I'm not supposed to be here. This is wrong. This is, this is all wrong. I've got to go. And the doctor sat me down and I hummed myself down and, you know, I had a broken finger, which is still crooked and a broken, a lump on my nose, which is still there. But he gave me the, uh, a couple of x-rays and, um, he was taking it very seriously. My injuries until I tried to tell him that I had talked to my grandfather and that I died and come back. And you know what he did? Folded his arms like this, sighed, and then he said to me, what drugs have you taken? <sighs> and my mother intervened and she said, my daughter doesn't take drugs, which is true. I, I, I don't drink, I, don't, I never do the recreation drug thing, even though I could have at that age. And she said, listen, you know, my daughter's had a head injury. The very least she's been unconscious for a long time and had, they started her heart. This doctor went into a diatribe about drug seeking teenagers in pain, wanting more drugs and blah, 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 blah. Hey. And, and I just looked at him and I thought, you don't get it. You're never going to get it. I wasn't defending myself. I could kind of care less about his diatribe. And I just said, I've got, got to go. I've got to get out of here. I've got to get back. So my mom loaded me into her uh, 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 Volkswagen Rabbit. It's a green car. Loaded me there. And she said, this doctor's not going to help you. I I'll stay with you to make sure you don't go unconscious. I'm not taking you to your apartment. I'm taking you to, the to my home. 
And when we got into this Merrifield uh, um, intersection, and I just decided I've got to get out of the car. I've got to go find my grandfather. And I started to get out of the car. My mother reached over and like, she got really scared. She, you know, I said, I got to go get Papa. So, uh, and then she says, you know, that's crazy. And I thought, yeah, yeah, it is. I know it is. I know it is. So she got me home to her house and I just sat on the couch and I, I wanted to explain something to her. But then her opinion didn't matter. Um, so it took me about 12 hours to calm down. Yeah. So in that 12 hours, was you, you're telling her what happened, but she wasn't buying a, a it? Little, a, no, my mother actually knew I was a bit, fairly logical girl. She, you know, we were, my mother and I were friends. And um, she, she knew how, you know, she... I didn't explain about the near death experience, but I think she was a little more open to about talking about her father than maybe most moms would be. I don't know, but I told her later, but I was so heartbroken, heartbroken to be back. You know, it was like I, I was grieving a death of not being there. Does that make sense, Peg? Yeah. Yeah. Because after my drowning at five years old, you know, my family went up to the house after I was revived and they just left me there. And I, I, I want to go back to the pond. I want to go back to where I was and what I was doing. Yeah. Well, oh, there's one thing I forgot to, um, I'm sorry, I, I omitted. Because I haven't talked about this in a couple of years with anybody. When I was at Source, before I got back to my grandfather. I had all these epiphanies and logical understandings of how things worked. As I was coming back to my grandfather, it started these, it was sort of being like an auto erase. These understandings, these comprehensions were starting to be taken out like out of my mind. Like I was shown something and I got very smart and understanding and knowledgeable. And then the knowledge was being revoked or um, taken back. And I didn't understand that, which got me more upset. So a lot of, um, there was a lot I went through and I remember the essence of it, but not the particulars. Does, does that make sense to you? It never did come back in time? Uh, some things did later, but not at, when I was 19. When I was 19 years old, I can say this now, I was a pretty girl. I, you know, tried modeling and did beauty, stupid beauty pageants and stuff. And yeah, I was just starting to experience life, having my own apartment, having a job. You know, I was just starting to live and uh, have to have a good time. So had it happened to me when I was more of a mature person or even had an inkling that this could have happened to somebody else, I would have handled it better. What I did do is after the hospital and I started to recover and, you know, I went back to work. The anxiety of it all, I went to see a therapist or a, a psychologist. And that was a big mistake. Yeah, back then, they to... haven't heard of these things. Uh, I'll just say her first name was Marjorie. Uh, uh, very, very smug, uh, self-righteous woman. Anyway, so I, I went to this therapist and I was very fat. And, you know, I told her what the, the doctor said, but she says, no, you are not the drug addict type. And I tried to tell her and she and then she leaned over and she said, are we having a pity party about our little broken nose situation? And I said, no, I just wow. I had a conversation with my dead grandfather. She said, you know, you can dream when you're unconscious. And I thought, no, I can't. No, I don't think so. Um, so she asked me if I was having a pity party. She says, pretty girls like you. And, you know, if they get damaged and it, it affects their self-esteem and blah, 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 blah. So, so her and the, the ER doctor both put their own crap onto you. And 19 year old who couldn't defend herself. Yeah. Yeah. Because those are all those, ha their hangups, you know, his hang up. He didn't exactly. like you saying that you were in an afterlife because obviously he doesn't believe in afterlife or he wouldn't have reacted that way. So he's putting on his religious views upon you and calling you a drug addict to 
ward off what was the knowledge coming to him and then same with her she probably had a hung up hang up because you were a young pretty girl and so i'm going to take this opportunity to put her down take her down a peg i didn't my psychologist marjorie i won't say your last name she was sort of like you could tell the girl in college that never got a date on saturday night uh-huh. you know, <laughs> you know? I, I could say some other things about her, but it w- uh, wouldn't be polite. Um, can I preface uh, this about something else? Can I tell you what happened to well, me sure. when I went out of body? Huh? Okay. Um, I want to backtrack this. When I was 12 years old, I was living in Ormond Beach, Florida, where I'm li- residing now. Um, I had another incident with a horse. I went to, on to uh, Airport Road and... Um, got on a horse, you know, running a horse and uh, above my abilities, the horse took off with me when I was 12, got up to the highway and then flipped up in the air and, and fell on uh, on top of me and it crushed. It, was crushed. it crushed my uh, ankle, uh, compound fractures and a lot of gore and a lot of missing skin that I won't go into and, and uh, broke my uh, left knee and then took the skin off my arms. I went like this at the very minute. So this horse took off with me, careened me. But the reason I'm, I'm telling you this is because just before the horse landed on top of me, and let me tell you, it hurt. I left my body like a slingshot being pulled like this. I left my body and I was parallel behind the horse and it was a buckskin mayor i had wavy hair uh you could i could see the curls in my hair because i've got wavy hair but i had long waist length hair then and i was wearing this green t-shirt and brand new jeans of course that would happen when a 12 year old had her brand new birthday jeans with (laughs) so i uh left my body and i was up in the air and i looked and saw myself start to fall down and the horse started to fall on top of me and then I was back in my body. Did you so see think, yourself from like behind or distance? Yeah, I was from I was from behind about 15 feet from behind and I was about six feet off the ground. Six feet off the ground and yeah saw me from behind and saw how my hair swiggled in the back which you know you don't look at the back of your head and I can make out the beautiful uh, leaves. My vision was more intense. It was brighter and clearer than my 2020 vision in my body. It was like a snapshot almost. It was so vivid and intense. And again, I was sucked back in. So that was, I was 12 years old when I had that close call and I was nearly killed. What saved my life is putting my hands in front of my face so my face didn't head didn't hit the pavements and um when i had that accident there were no tears the horse pushed me into the road to right itself and 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 broke another bone it got up and left and i on one foot hopped back to the barn to call my parents and then i went into severe shock before i got to the hospital it wasn't life-threatening but it if i'd hit my head hard uh, that was would have been life ending. Um, it was very surreal for a 12 year old to leave the body. And I told my mother and my mother absolutely believed me. And cool. I didn't discuss it with anybody else because it was too weird. And gee, I was 12, you know, but I think that opened something. So when I had the accident at 19, just a few years later, there seems to be some sort of connection. What do you think? I agree that it seems like once, like I, you know, drowned at five years old. Yeah. And then, you know, I was out of my body. I was like this ghost girl, just, you know, roaming around. I didn't go through space or anything. But at 25, I went through the tunnel, just like you. It was instant, right in the tunnel, like that. And you knew you're not in Kansas anymore. I mean, you knew you were dead because I was sitting in a wheelchair in the hospital, suddenly I'm in this tunnel. So what else are you gonna think other than I died? Did it, did it feel like the you didn't touch the walls, but you knew they were soft? 
Yeah, I, I, no, I don't know about soft. I never thought of that word. Um, they seem to have a, 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 texture. a texture that I can't describe. Airy, light, soft, comforting? For some reason, inside a snake skin comes to mind. Something that you can see through, but you know it's there. And rigid. There's a rigidness to it. But I can see through because I would say like I'm in a straw being sucked through. Like you can see, uh, you can see you're in a container, but you can see out of it. Like not windows, but you know, like it's transparent. Because I can see space. Like I was shoot, shot through space, but I'm inside this thing. Did you go through the the layers, the dimensions before source? I heard a knock, knock every so often. Mostly it was the loud wind speed. Like if you was in, when you watch a rocket taken off on TV and that, pshh, that, low, that loud vibration and force, I was hearing that real loud. But every now and then I would hear like a knock, a knock. And to me, that was like I was entering another dimension, going up higher and higher and higher. It's, you know, go, this is how I try to explain it. Okay, when I was moving, it, it was like shooting up like a bottle rocket to me, going through different dimensions or, la uh, or, or layers of non-physical reality and going inward. Less every layer or every dimension to source, from here to here to source, was less dense, more thought responsive till I got to source. And that was more, that was like hitting reality. Is that a good, I don't, I don't know if I'm the best explainer. At the end of the tunnel, was that where you seen your, the whiteness or how was that? That was after going through these multiple layers. That's what I did. I went through the tunnel, and there's this loud wind speed, this vibration, this, you know, going through something, and then all of a sudden, perfectly still in a white light, and I looked down, and there was no me. That I felt just like me. That vibration felt wonderful. Oh, I, I hated it, because I was 25. I was like you at 19, oh, you know. Yeah. I didn't want to die. I was still in that, I don't want to do this, because I had three little boys at home. It's very different. I had no children. Yeah. Yeah. But it was yeah. still that, you know, I'm young. I haven't lived my life yet. Yeah. You know, it's kind of sad, but eh, I, you know, I, what I was feeling after I came back in that 12 hours I was recovering, I wanted to talk to my boyfriend at the time and tell him how much I loved and cared for him. But I waited because, you know, my face really hurt after breaking my nose. Like, I still got that bump there. I love this bump. It's a reminder of what I we went through. Um, when I finally went back to my apartment and called him because I wanted to share this with him, he was negative, kind of cruel, dismissive about the accident. And then he says to me, well, I'm not alone. So he had this cruelty in him. What did he that had, mean? I'm not alone. He had a girlfriend with him. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the, the nice thing to say when he knew I just almost been killed in an accident, he turned out to be a very negative force. But um, you have this tremendous, I had this aftermath where I wanted to get things right, you know, relationships, travel. I mean, I want, I had this like urgency of getting my life right. That's what I felt like. And just when I thought I could do it, I was dealt a second blow. Yeah, and I do think, you know, you asked me earlier, I guess I didn't really finish the, what you asked me, but I do think once we've been out of our body, it is easier to go out again. It's just oh, like yeah. it leaves a crack or something. Like we're in this solid container, so we don't get out. But if we've been out once, it seems like it leaves this crack and that something happens, like bam. It's not so solid. Yeah. It's not so solid. Um, yeah, I mean, I had a hard time with it, but... Um, Right after that, I ha uh, uh, I became ill, physically ill. Didn't understand what this is my purpose, but I have autoimmune disease. This was after the 19-year-old? Yeah. Thing? Okay. 
So like right after within a couple of months, I started getting very sick and uh, it's been challenging. So basically since I'm a young person and I'm in my sixties now, uh, fighting autoimmune disease has been pretty brutal, you know, 29 surgeries, uh, massive drugs, yada, yada, yada. But there's also been something very comforting because you can believe in something. Somebody can tell you about God. Somebody can tell you about their NDE. But when you've experienced it, it's a known. Right. It's not a belief. It's a known. Yep. And that's sort of been the pillar that kept me strong because, you know, I had to go to the hospital every week for 15 years for a plasma transfusion. It wasn't fun. It wasn't fun. It was just necessary. Um all the surgeries were necessary if I wanted to live. And I kept feeling, you know, I've got to stay alive. There's, there's got to be, you know, more of a purpose. And I think I hit it, hit the nail on the head, you know, as much as I could. Yeah, it seems like we're giving something at a younger age that God knows will help us later in life that we Perhaps, will need. But I had some intervention from the other side that kept me alive. So I cannot, I cannot, I can't complain. Would you like me to share that with you? Yes. Um, when I was, um, I guess I was, yeah, I was 34. I had a tremendous uh, immune attack, lupus attack. I, and I felt terrible. I was in bed. I went up to the Mayo Clinic, blah, blah, blah. Oh, you're okay. You're just being miserable. It's not going to be that bad. And I thought, God, you know, I feel really bad. Um, so I was staying at my mom's and I went to bed one night. I thought, oh man, this is just, I'm not exaggerating. I woke up and my grandfather walked into my bedroom. I was completely awake. He had on a plaid shirt. He had on a pair of dress pants with a pleat, a little false pocket with a, a button and a very thin belt. Um, he didn't have his glasses on. He came over and I'm overjoyed, unable to talk. I am like, he just came in my bedroom. My God, he's in living color. Holy. <laughs> and he sits down and he, he sits on the bed and he takes his hand over my abdomen. Your spleen, your spleen. And then he just dissolved. And it was over. And I'm, I get up and I'm, you know, I'm wide awake. I'm wide awake. Um, this is like 930 in the morning. I mean, I'm totally awake and I'm like electrified. And I went in and told my mother and I described uh, the check, the the gray and the um, on his check shirt. It was button down flannel, the gray and like a burgundy. And I, I, I she said, I, that, I've seen that shirt. I seen him wear that shirt. I described the pants completely. She, he said, she, he had a pair of pants like that with a little tiny false pocket with a button and on the, you know, uh, towards the belt. And I said, I said, you're gonna think I'm crazy, but if I don't have my spleen out, I'm gonna die. And then I looked at my mother and I said, where's your spleen? <laughs> I didn't, I didn't know where my spleen was. So I went to my doctor and I tried to like, I don't want to look like a mental patient or insane. I said, listen, I think I'm in trouble. There's more going on. Um, and this doctor said, you know, Janice, you're hemming and hawing. I know you, what is it? And I told him and he got out his little like prescription, you know, pad. I thought, oh Jesus, he's going to give me some like antipsychotic medicine. And I said, well, what are you writing for me? He says that I'm ordering a, uh, a, a, a splenectomy. Finally, said, somebody listened to you. <laughs> this guy, this, this guy, Gary, he was, he's a good doctor. Um, he said, he said, first of all, I've heard some strange things over the years. He said, I've heard some strange things. And I think he said, this might be on top of the list. He said, but you know, there could be uh, are good reason. And um, I'm going to write this it's physician's order for a splenectomy. He says, you're on your own getting uh, a surgeon. 
I said, uh, and he says, I'm not going to write this down in your notes. You know, I don't want this to follow you the rest of your life. So I said, okay. So I went to one surgeon. They said, well, we, you know, we ran that, um, those tests on you six months ago when you were okay. And I said, I'm not okay now. And he said, well, we'll have to wait another six months. So I went to another surgeon because you know what? I'm a tough cookie. I was going to get this done. I walked into the surgeon in Daytona Beach and I'm like, I told him, not what my grandfather said, that I, I have a physician's order for a splenectomy. So he gave me an exam. And the doctor said, I, I said, do you think I could get it out this spring? And he said, how's about Wednesday? So this gets more weird, Peg. So he said, it feels like there's a football in there. And I thought, okay. So I get a splenectomy. And let me tell you, you when I woke up, I wish I hadn't done it. It was so bad bad oh. it's like getting gut it's the worst it was the most painful operation I've ever been through I'm mean, like not I was not a happy person and he came in there and talked to me afterwards and he said you know what this is weird he said your liver was so inflamed and your liver capsule so inflamed I mistook that you had a large enlarged spleen he said you didn't have an enlarged spleen and I went oh cripes you know this this operation was unnecessary and he goes but your spleen had imploded, hemorrhage, had a large clot the size of a man's fist, and one good thump or just a few hours, you would have bled to death. What? <laughs> and, you know, like my parents were like looking at me and I was looking at my parents and I, was, I said, you know, I wasn't exaggerating. Maybe next time Papa will give me the lotto numbers, you know. <laughs> I've got full body chills. <laughs> It was very surreal seeing my grandfather getting the message and then finding out, you know, I was like a few hours or a few minutes away from death. But he came. The wonderful thing is the beauty of this story is Pegasus. He still loved me just as much as when he was alive and I was 12. <laughs> Do you think he's your guardian angel, your grandpa? I think... I have got different theories. I, well, not a guardian angel. He's just, I think that um, people that love you, people that are connected to you in physical reality, when they die, they can come back and forth. Most don't. There's, I don't think there's like hauntings too terribly often or demons or anything like that. But I think sometimes they'll step in when you really need it most and either give you comfort or a direct message or something that helps you. I know when I cross over, if I'm given the opportunity, I will definitely sign up for doing that for my grandkids, like watching them like a hawk to be ready to, you know, things like that. Well, the good news is nobody dies in World War II. Nobody dies in the, this physical reality. Nobody really dies. I mean, you're going to leave this dimension. Your body's going to die, but you're going to the next place, wherever that may be, that there is a continuation of existence. And I find it very comforting. Yeah. Yeah. It's just as being a ghost child for those few m minutes, I don't know how long, you know, mm -hmm. I've tried to guess before 15 minutes, 30 minutes. I don't know how long I was dead, uh, but I know what it's like to be that. I was trying to talk to other kids that was walking down the highway and they were ignoring me. They couldn't hear me. And then this younger boy that was walking, we, I realized we were talking telepathic. You know, I didn't know that word back then, but you know, mm -hmm. we were, I were talking through his mind. I said, where are you going? Huh? Huh? What are you doing? Huh? Huh? What are you doing? What are you doing? You know? And he kept ignoring me. Finally, he started answering me. Oh, we've been fishing. We're in a hurry home. And then he stopped answering. I'm thinking now, as I get older, I look back at that. How many times I wonder have we all had like something just kind of interjected and we just like don't even realize? Yeah, I, I, you know, my late sister and my mother uh, really took a lot of comfort in the fact that my grandfather, you know, was here still helping me. Yeah, well, he's still connected to me. You know, he didn't forget me, yeah. which was really wonderful. Uh, both my parents and sister have passed since, so I know I'll see them again. Um, it's just kind of hard being the one left behind. 
I've had a few mediums on my show, and they've all come up with the same thing. And I don't think they've watched all of my shows to know what the other one said. But um, th I could tell who they were talking about was my ex-mother-in-law. That was the one that was always coming through. And it, you know, first time, I didn't think much of it. Second time, huh, that's a coincidence. Third time, I thought, is she really here? You know? So. Yeah. You know, you know, when you want it to happen, it doesn't. <laughs> and when it does, the message come, usually comes in sideways for me. I mean, I don't have a, you know, I can't channel my dead end Sally and find out where she hid the silver, nothing like that. But what I can say is that some of these things that have happened to me have been uh, meaningful and comforting and, you know, it makes you feel less isolated. Uh, luckily now people are talking about near-death experience. Unfortunately, back in 1979, nobody, nobody really was other than a Raymond Moody and I hadn't heard of him. So. Right. I hadn't either in 1986 when I had my second one. I'm curious, how old were you when you grandpa, your grandpa died? I was 12. Was you near him, around him when he passed? Uh, well, we, I was very close to him. He was up in New York State. I was in, in Norman Beach, Florida at the time because I was still going in, you know, I was still in uh, grammar school. Um, he died a horrible death. Uh, prostate cancer, long involved therapies. It was a hellish exit for a year. It was just hellish for him, which I had to hear everything. And when you're a little kid, it makes it you more anxious. And it, it was very traumatic when he died. I felt horrible that he suffered so much. Okay. I was just curious. Now, yeah. His wife, my grandmother, who I absolutely adored, um, I was able to tell her all these things before she died, the communication I had with him. And she took a lot of comfort in that. That's nice when there. you can do yeah. that. Yeah. I found out something kind of interesting about the family. Would you like me to share that? Sure. I thought I took a lot of courage. I was 24. I was visiting my, um, my grandmother for Thanksgiving and it was just her and me. And I like hemmed and hawed, you know, am I going to tell her that, you know, I talked to her husband, blah, 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 blah. So I just blurted it out. <laughs> just like, you know, and she couldn't shut me up. I kept going for a few minutes. <laughs> and she said, she said, Janice, I always wondered if you had the gift. And I said, what gift? <laughs> <You know? laughs> because she told me her mother, Catherine Marston, George, her mother, had the gift. My great grandmother people would come to her when they were ailing and she could help heal them at times. She knew things before it happened. She'd seen, you know, visitations of deceased people. She was a very well respected uh, in the community of Barry's Bay, you know, it's in, near Ontario in Canada. And she died when she was uh, still, um, you know, I think in her forties from uh, append appendicitis. But she had all these experiences and it's like my grandmother started to tell me about them and it's like, oh man, if somebody just told me this earlier, I wouldn't have anguished so much Right. about sharing it. I found out a lot of interesting things about my great grandmother and um, one of my uncles um, was able to, you know, have some spirit communication or whatever. And I talked to him and then I didn't feel like such a freak. Yeah, I just, we I, don't, I, I, it's not in family conversations when we're growing up, this kind of thing. Usually most families. Yeah, not my family. Um, the funny thing is, uh, I would tell, you know, my sister, my mom, stuff, but that I compartmentalized my out of body or near death or whatever you want to call it, um, experiences. I compartmentalized it. But things have when you put the lid on a pot things have a way of boiling over so i dreamed a dream of a a, a a a book and i eventually wrote it and i wrote in all my experiences in these fictional books i'm not plugging my book but it was just an outlet because i had to get it out all these thoughts all these feelings all these you know what i'd been through um 
you know, I still wasn't going to talk about it. And then I like hit 50 and they, and you know, a publisher told me, oh, you, you know, no one's ever going to believe this unless you, unless you lend some authenticity. And I thought, well, I'm over 50. What have I got to lose? And then I started talking about it and people connected with me and they had something similar. And it, it was, I wish I'd done it years ago. Right. Me too. Instead of keeping it in and feeling, I couldn't share this with my husband. But there is something uh, that I want your opinion on. When you've had a near-death experience, Peg, um, and you really, it changes you. And it, it, sep doesn't it, it separated me from other people in many ways. Did it affect you that way? Because they couldn't really get it. Um, I always felt like an outsider looking in since I was a kid. Always felt separated from everybody anyway. And then when I had the NDE, I couldn't breathe a word of it. It was something I felt I had to tuck way inside and deal with on my own. And months later, I did bring it out to my ex. And I sat him down at the table and told him. And he looked at me and he said, I know how it sounds. But I know you. I know you're telling me the truth. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that felt good for that moment. But then the next moment was, but what do I do now? That, like, this doesn't go away. You, just because you told it, you think now it'll feel better, but it doesn't. It feels like there's got to be more. There's something I'm supposed to do. What do I do with this? Like it was a too big, too big of a thing to just throw away. And yeah. so... I told my sister, who I uh, growing up, she always told ghost stories, which I never believed. And, you know, I didn't like that kind of talk. You know, if I could have heard what my aunt, I found out my mom's oldest sister later, you know, when I, after my kids were grown, I found out that my mom says, oh, you're like her. She always knew things before that happened, before somebody died, she'd know. And, and she says, you must have got that from her. And then my aunt um, she's kind of like the story, note, the movie Notebook, because she wrote her story down, a little pamphlet, not really a big book, but it was you know, jots of her life, and I read that, and I noticed she drowned as a child in that. And then at the end of the book, she kind of hand wrote, wrote some things, which the rest was tight, and she said, my family told me I left this out and I should include it. So she hand wrote times she had where she knew someone was going to pass, those kind of psychic experiences. Yeah. And I thought, man, I wish I could have heard that growing up. Wouldn't it have helped? Yeah. Wow. Well, think about this. People are getting resuscitated now in record numbers that they never did through history because of medical advances. People are coming back when, you know, usually, usually when you have a heart attack, you're dead. Now they have defibrillators and they have bypass machines and all this crap. Um, and I think that's why people are talking about it more. And I've, hooked up and, and, and talk to others with a near-death experience and we have a commonality because we've got it. We can realize there's a continuation of existence. People have different NDEs and they have different experiences and sometimes they go through maybe a past life or sometimes they go through their own poor actions or poor decisions, how it's affected other people or wonderful stuff. It's all tailored to us, but you have that commonality, it's changed you. It changed your perspective. And having the word near-death experience, like having the internet or a TV show yeah. or that yeah. talks about, says near-death experience, then you have something to look up in the library. And now yeah. once we got the internet, to look up the internet and all kinds of information. But in 86, when I had mine, I you know, after I told my husband, I thought, where do I find out if anybody else, because I was sure nobody ever had, but I thought, where do I find out more? And even when I told my um, husband months later, um, that day I sat him down and talked to him, that day I had seen him on Oprah Winfrey. And I don't remember hearing the word near-death experience. But she had some people on there that I, in my mind, said were weirdos. That was saying they died. And, and I thought, oh my God, how ridiculous. That's how far hidden I had this. Because the death of my twins came with that near-death experience. So I wanted it you know, far away from me. So I oh my God, how ridiculous. And I took a step back to go in the kitchen and fix dinner. And something hit me. Why does this sound so familiar? It felt like this invisible wall just come over me and stop right here. 
And I was just like frozen, like, why does that sound so familiar? Like, oh my God, it was real. It was real. What happened in that wheelchair in the emergency room when I lost the twins? That was real. And I just shook all over. Well, I mean, it's also compounded with horrible grief and loss. Yeah. You know, you're a strain. Uh, the, the strain of that is got to be. Oh, you're a strong woman and you've got a powerful message to share. That's your purpose and 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 people that love you. But uh, that had to be such a mixed bag for you to carry. I'm so sorry you had to go through all that. And, you know, I was remarried when I was 36 and mm -hmm. I um, had all these adopted kids and I went upstairs in my room, had some time alone because I, you know, worked full time. I went to school full time, had all these kids and foster kids, you know, I was a busy person. And I, I'm gonna go up here and be alone and clean my room. I turned on the uh, radio and I fell in with trying to find something. And I come across, first time I ever heard of Christian pop. Mm -hmm. And I love this stuff. So I just cranked it and was cleaning. And something about the words in those songs, and something happened. And all of my experiences just started like, not like full blown, but like kind of touching on me. And I went and got my kids and I brought them to the bedroom and I set them down on the bed and I'm standing there all animated and I just started crying. And my kids were like, mom, they never see me like this. I had never been like this. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, I gotta get these kids in church because my ex was all in Catholic and now I gotta figure out what I'm gonna do. But so it, it something opened up, but yet I still was busy. And it was probably like you in my 50s. And so I was like, I've got to do something. I would try to write down my story, but my story is so much with child abuse that I would just like throw it away, get that away from me. Who would want to read this? And yeah. then I think I was 55 maybe when one morning it just dawned on me that I had been, because I see little visions sometimes that teach me things like I had during my drowning and then during my other India, these little visions opened up and it's almost like a communication yeah. And I wasn't realizing that then. It was just like, what was this? I just saw this image. And now I know this understanding is knowing that I have been bearing my near-death experiences, my spiritual experiences under the rug with the abuse just the same. And I oh. had to tell the story yeah. of all of it for him to appreciate the bad. I had to tell, the, to appreciate the good, I had to tell the bad. And the I mind, the typing. <laughs> the mind peg, it compartmentalizes things that you're not able to process. You know, yeah, you know, you're a very brave woman. You've been through a lot. Um, I have to say something. I want to add something about my near death experience. Sure. That's OK. I didn't have a religious epiphany. I didn't have a come to Jesus moment at all. I didn't have an anti religious experience, but it was spiritual understanding. It was not a religious experience whatsoever for me. Um, more of a factual type thing, you know, that, you know, I've, I've been to this place and it was great when you go to source. I mean, there's like no drug and no, nothing, and nothing could come close to this. You know, it, it's so wonderful. And that seemed, you know, it seemed very natural to go to source. You know, it, you just want to stay there wrapped in love, like floating in a sea of love and it's bright but there's no sun and you're not hot and you're not cold and you're not hungry or you're thirsty you just feel freaking wonderful and i think you said like you felt you were the source it was yeah um it's, it's hard for me to explain okay I, this is my theory and i could be wrong but you have a soul you know a soul that needs to learn and you are, you go into physical reality at different times period, you know, it could be the 1600s, the 1800s, the 2000s, and you're born, but your soul fractures into different personalities and lives different lives. And when you die, you eventually make it back to source. Was that heaven? No, there's something probably way far beyond that. This is as far as I got. I got to go back to my own personal origin or source. That's what I'm saying. This is my theory. I could be wrong, but this is what it, it made me feel that my, you're, you're, you fracture into all these different personalities and then you meet up again with um, these valuable lessons. Um, I'm not 
any rocket scientist or anything, but I'm pretty sure I'm close. I what see what you're saying, because during the drowning, even though, you know, I'm, I say God, I say heaven, because I, I experience those things. But in the five-year-old drowning, when you, I think you said you saw things, your vision was better and clearer than ever. Oh, my gosh. I experienced that as well. Yeah. And those memories that we have out of body are like encapsulated. Like, I think because we remember them from our soul, not from our body and brain, because we were out of that, remembering from our soul and that you call source, whatever, you know, that, that same place, we're talking about the same thing. Mm -hmm. And it's the knowings that come, you know, if there's telepathic communication, you saw your grandpa. I mean, all those things are just realer than real because it seems like our senses there are so much more intelligent than here and magnified yeah 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 i felt like i was a smarter person when i was done <laughs> sorry yeah and when i kept back from yeah. the 25 year old nde i was changed i felt different because and i think that when we come back from being there we're not the same person anymore we're this enhanced but we don't know it's enhanced because we don't know what to do with it. We don't understand our changes, especially it happened as a child, even as a young woman. We don't understand, oh, I'm different now. I feel about this. I feel. We don't get it. And I think until we get older, maybe at past our 50s, that when we get that maturity level to handle that information. And you know what also, we, you know, when you're young or, or or most people, we all have different prejudices. I'm not talking about race or ethnicity. You know, it could be money, uh, somebody's education, you know, uh, life's experiences, blah, blah, blah. When you go to source and you see you've lived these different lives, it is so freaking humbling, yeah. humbling that gone is the absurdity of prejudice because, you know, Maybe in another life, I was a black woman struggling, or I was uh, a poor peasant, or whatever. You know, I had to live this life and learn whatever the heck I had to learn. It's extremely humbling. We've all been around the block, I think. Um, I actually, after my five year old NDE, I was at a pre Sunday school class right almost across from the pond, just down the road a little bit mm -hmm. <clears throat> before that happened. And um, I was coloring this picture of Jesus on a rock one child on his lap and two beside him standing and I was coloring. I got so into it and I um, was singing Jesus loves me over and over. Next thing I know, I am having the most real vivid experience. That picture is now alive. I am there in a physical place. Jesus is sitting right there on the rock. The children are standing right there beside him. There's a child on his lap and I am standing in front of Jesus in that rock. Okay. And I want to push that kid off. I don't. I'm staying. I'm going to be good. But I want to push that kid off the rock because I want to sit on Jesus' lap. I wanted to sit there because I, I could feel his love. And he looked at me and smiled. And I was so, so happy. And a voice, not Jesus, but this voice in my head said so clearly, children or Jesus loves children of every color. Never forget that. And I did not catch on to the irony of that until I'm in my 50s. Color, that's what I was doing. I was coloring. Mm -hmm. I was coloring. So, you know, I guess now that I just now think of it, I could have colored those children brown, yellow, you know. I mean, you know, but it was like Jesus loves children of every color. Never forget that. And the wisdom of that. And, you know, and like you said earlier, it doesn't matter what anybody says, you know. And I know that experience was real. I know I was there. And I know Jesus because I was face to face in front of him and saw him look at me and smile. And you know, I've heard other people's NDEs and they're so beautiful when they did this with Jesus. And I was like, I never had that. I never had that. And then I realized later, wait a minute, but you had that. Yeah. You had that. So it wasn't during an NDE. But so, and I think some of us when we come back we've got like one foot there and one foot here 
Oh, oh yeah. Oh, oh, you're never really fully back. I can say that. Um, I had a, a, a question that was posed to me um, when I was discussing this on a show. And um, I said, did this make you a better person? I said, no. <laughs> <laughs> I have a potty mouth. I um, I do too. Sometimes I have a bad temper. I'm no, this, I am not St. Laura. Uh, I'm just a little more informed. Yeah. So, it, but, um, and I've got a little more understanding. So uh, it jump started something in my spiritual development, but um, it didn't, you know, make me all that nicer. <laughs> and during my five year old drowning, I was told, well, first I got this knowing my family didn't love me. I, oh, I didn't know that. And then I got told in a voice, like inside me, children are sent here to be loved. That is why God sends them here. And I was like, well, that's not fair. You tell me my family don't love me. And then you say children are sent here to be loved. Well, that's not fair. And this little injustice, little brat began. And it's still here. <laughs> and I'm sure it'll still be there when I'm older. And it's just like, I just have to fight injustice. Like, I just have to, like, say, speak my mind. And, and I just, I can't put up with anything that's, you know, that I think is not right. And You know what I, I think um, some of this taught me? You know, it's important to be clear with people, uh, fair, and polite. But you don't have to be nice necessarily. You know, you have to be nice when you feel comfortable enough to be nice. You know, women are always taught, oh, you've got to be nice. You've got to be nice. Not so much. That's what I like about getting older and then drawing on some of these experiences. You know, if, if someone, uh, I, I've had people say some, you know, odd things to me and non-flattering things. So this one, with this one guy said to me, he says, well, how do you know all this stuff? And it's all bull and blah, yada, yada. And I said, well, in a hundred years, we're both going to be dead. And I'm going to tell you, I told you so. <laughs> so I just, I just laughed like that. And, you know, it's good to share this with someone you love that you know is dying or sick. I had these uh, conversations with my mother trying to prepare her before she died because I took care of both of my parents. Uh, gosh, that was for five years that were both dying. Mother had cancer, dad had Parkinson's. Um, and my father couldn't talk about it. And I dropped hints and, and told him things. He had a hard time. But would you like me to share with you yes, something? I'm very interested in that. Died? Okay, dad was on the decline, but mentally sharp. This guy did crossword puzzles and pen every morning and didn't make a mistake. I can't do that. So this is just a few weeks before he died. He got up from a nap and I had, was getting, you know, the dinner ready and it was like 530. And he said, was there a party here? Was there a party here? And I said, Dad, nobody's been in the house, just me and the dog. And he said, gosh, he said, well, I, I just talked to Bill Purdy. Now that's my cousin that died. And he named some other people that were dead. He said, we're here and just talking to me. And I said, well, you know, he died a long time ago. Yeah, but he was just here. And I said, okay, let's have some dinner. So I'm getting him to the kitchen table and all of a sudden, he uh, has an ischemic stroke and he drops. And I caught him and rip, broke my, you know, ripped my uh, rotator cuff and, you know, Parkinson people flail. And I caught him before he hit the ground. Got him to the chair, got the nurses and my friends to come over and stuff. He had an ischemic stroke, which he did recover from in 24 hours, but very, could have, you know, could have killed him. So... A couple of days later, he said, you know, that party, everybody was there and they were so glad to see me. And they told me that, you know, they were just so glad to see me. And um, my cousin, Bill, that died, he was a great guy. He was a great dog. And he just was so, uh, it was so good to know that, you know, he's there waiting for dad. And then my father passed, you know, just like, oh gosh, you know, a couple of weeks later. But to know that, you know, Bill was waiting, you know, he died like in the 70s, not a long time ago. And um, that made me feel very good. And it gave my dad, I think, a little comfort before he went. But when he was 
uh, in bed and I, I kept my parents at home to die at home. I knew that when they both died, I, I mean, I was of course grief stricken, they died. I was so happy that, that, you know, my mom didn't have cancer. I was so happy my dad wasn't in pain. You know, it was such a relief. Knowing that there is continuation of existence made me handle their death so much better. It was really comforting for me because I'll see them again one day. And I'll say to my dad, hey, I told you so. You should have listened. I love that story of your dad's party because a year ago, January, I was severely ill for four days. I lost 13 pounds in two days Ooh. or four days. And um, I often um, pass out. It's just my thing when I'm sick and I've never had an experience. But my husband said, I said, I told him I must get the blanket, put it on the bathroom floor because that's where I like to lay when I'm sick because I shoot out both ends. And then I pass out. Um, and I says, he says, let me get you. Don't lay on that cold floor again tonight. He says, let me get you a blanket. As he went out to get me a blanket, I hit the floor because I, Ooh. you know, you, when you pass out on the floor, you're safe. And that's why I always get to the floor as soon as I have to feel sick. But so I, I thought, oh, here I go. And next I know I passed out. But this time, so when I hit the floor, like I, felt, I felt myself start to go. And then I knew my body was on the floor, but I went into the wall right beside me. And there's this big party going on. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was like, right, so close to the wall, but it's like this was separating us. Like people in the park, in the wall was having this big party. And I was like, huh, what are you saying? What are you saying? And you know how at a party, at least we keep, even before social distancing, we keep a little physical distance. They yeah. weren't, they were all tight up against each other and didn't care. It was just like this sea of people laughing and celebrating and rejoicing and so happy. And I could um, hear the volumes of, like who was taller and who was shorter, that male and female, I could hear all that. And this one woman that seemed closer to me, I could hear her the best. And I'm like, huh, what'd you say? What'd you say? Mm -hmm. And then something just kind of told me, you can either go and join or start focusing on your husband's voice and go back. Because if you go there, you won't come back. It was this knowing. It wasn't a voice saying it. It was a knowing. Like curiosity killed a cat. Yeah. And so I heard my husband's voice in the distance say, baby, baby, baby. And so I focused on that. And then he said my eyes was fluttering and, and he got me to come back. But so when you say that, it was just a little tiny out of body experience. Mm -hmm. When you said that about your dad's, par the party I was picturing, I said, yeah. I know what that's like. You should have seen his face. Like he came out of the bedroom and he was looking in the living room. Where are, where is everybody? And he goes, I, did you have a, there was a party, you know? So these, they were all waiting to help guide my dad over. So dad's fine. You know, I mean, he's fine. Yeah. So that, that's very, very comforting. Anyway, I had a tough relationship with my father, but taking care of him the last five years of his life, we grew very close. He was a man that never wanted children and, you know, got forced into it you know, parenthood because my mother wanted children. And, you know, he had some real difficulties being a parent. But boy, was he grateful for the care. He really was. Well, I love that you have that um, happy chapter into the story with your father. I'm not going to have that with my mother. I didn't have with my father. But because you are actually the norm, you know, we expect that. We expect that like the movies. You're going to have the happy ending, you know, the hospital scene where the the cruel parent, not saying your father was cruel, but, you yeah. know, where they finally have their moment. Oh, yeah. My father oh, felt, don't get it. <laughs> Dad felt really bad. He was very hard on me for being dyslexic. But, you know, I mean, listen, I'm always going to be dyslexic. I don't even I don't care anymore. After my had my splenectomy, I just kind of let go of that crap, you know, or any of the old wounds. You know, I later became a filmmaker, an author, and a podcaster. So I had a great creative outlet um, that came kind of easy for me and was interesting. So I've had a good career. It just wasn't the type of career that he wanted. Now, you made some um, near-death experience interviews yourself. On, was it YouTube? or? Yes, I did some first-person um, out-of-body experience, my near-death and my return, and uh, put that on uh i put that on youtube 
Um, is that your name? Like, can they put in for YouTube on your name and it'll come up or? You know, it's just easier. If you go to my website, L-U-R-A-K-E-T-C-H dot com, you can do on the, you know, you can get, you can click onto the YouTube channel and, or you just go into my, you know, about, you know, about the author. And then I have links to um, the different experiences that I've had. Is there links for your books on that website? Yeah. Okay. And I took um, my paranormal experiences, my near-death experience, and some of my grandmother's, great-grandmother's experiences. And then I, my outlet was to write this, these fictional, you know, murder mysteries and mystery, paranormal mysteries, but put in to pepper it with about 95% of the truth of how things work to kind of express myself and explain you know, um, what it's like to, you know, leave physical reality. And I have this group that comes together and they talk about their near death experiences in the book. So that was great because people have different perspectives and I've done uh, a bit of research. There's a lot of, uh, a lot to wade through when you read about near death experiences, some very authentic, some a little less authentic to me. So I, you kind of, you know, just like everything in life, you kind of, you know, take the pros and the cons and decide for yourself. So my thing is I don't preach to anybody. Um, I don't advocate any religion. I just try to tell you what happened to me, how it changed me, and that it's beautiful knowing that I'm going to see all the people I like that have passed again. Now, there's a few that's passed in my family that I could skip on. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> yeah, I have like one aunt and I thought, gosh, I hope she's not there, you know. I really don't know how my uncle could have stood her. Um, there's a couple people that I like to avoid in the family, but um, most of them, it's just nice to know that, you know, death is not the end. Can I share with you another philosophy that I gained? Sure. It, I, I feel personally... I don't want to preach. Um, it's very important to live in the present. You know, this is 2022. I'm here right now in Orange Beach, Florida, living the best life I can, the most authentic. I'm not waiting to have a good time when I die. I'm trying to live the most I can now because it's very important to live your best life and to be, I don't want to damage anybody or screw them up, you know, or, or screw them over. Um, and to be, you know, pretty nice to people, it, that's important, but to kind of live your best life and, and, and things like that. So I'm not all I'm one of these people, you know, that are just so obsessed with the paranormal that I'm, you know, missing out on life. I'm not. I get up, I go to the gym in the morning. It's not pretty, but I got to do it, you know. <laughs> My husband and I both recently retired, and that's what I've been telling him is we've worked our whole life. We're not going to work the rest of it. We're going to learn how to yes. have fun. I don't know what yes. we're going to be doing, but we're going to find something that's fun for us. We're not the bar Crazy. scene people. We're not the sports people. We're not, you know, but so we're going to, we're going to figure this out and find out just what do we want to do? Well, I've, you know, really always been, you know how people will, okay, when you're young, you think you need all this stuff. You know, you need the big house and a lot of clothes and the designer crap and the fancy car, blah, 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 blah. After you have an NDE, those things don't have any luster to them. We're not taking them you with know, us. You wanna, yeah, you want to live in a nice home, have enough to eat, but you can wear one pair of shoes at a time and eat one steak at a time. Beyond that, it's just, it just doesn't do it for me. It, yeah. it really, really changed me because like when I was a teenager, I think, oh, Oh my gosh, I'd want to have a bunch of horses. I'd want this and that. After 19 at the NDE, no. I did get the, I did have a horse. I got a horse when I was in my 20s and I had him for, you know, 25 years. He was a family member and loved him. But, you know, my house was modest, but it was cheerful and it was all I needed. There's about, there's something that I think an NDE does. It's this grounding of your values. Your core values are so changed and improved and it's a relief to get off that 
merry-go-round of want that, you know, society tells us. Right. And when my mother-in-law, my husband's mom, when she passed, we were left with taking care of all the financial stuff, cleaning the house. Her husband was still uh, there, but he's got Parkinson's. And so it was all up to us. I mean, there's other kids, but they didn't live around there. And yeah. I've told my kids, I don't want that for them. I want to get rid of everything so they don't have to come in here. And what do we do with this crap? Because yeah. they're, they're, they live in nice homes. They, they are not hoarders like I am. They are not going to want this stuff. Yeah. And so I'm going to have to figure out a way to start giving stuff away. <laughs> Even though I'm only yeah. 61, I just feel like yeah. there's too much heat. We, I've lived here for almost 40 years. So, you yeah. know, when you move, you clean out. And then you move, you clean out. I've never cleaned out because I haven't moved. Oh, boy. <laughs> yeah, don't do that to your mind to go like, I, I had to do everything. Like when my sister died and both my parents, you know, go through all the, the stuff. I just donated a lot, a lot of things, you know, to charities, which was great because it got reused clothes and I, you know, gave some things, kept some stuff, but I've got a little modest condo and, you know, I'm as happy as can be in it because it's, it's all I need and all I want. I'm trying to get the best years because I'll be 63 in a couple of weeks, get, you know, enjoy my years. I mean, the time ahead of me is quite limited compared to the time of, you know, behind me. Um, you do have an urgency to get things right and, and, and things like that, because we know when we cross over, you're still you, problems and all. So you might as well fix them while you're here. And I think you said something about, you know, how does it make it as different after having an NDE? For me, it's when I'm in a room with women around my age, I feel like a foreigner because they're all talking about things I don't care about. I don't care about face cream and how and diets and exercise and i mean i know that says healthy you got to be healthy but I, I don't care about trying to look younger trying to live longer i don't care about any of that yeah i just want to be as healthy as i can be before i you know cross over but um <laughs> it's still that you know a lot of people will hang on to that youth and you know you're in your 60s you're not going to look 40. I don't care how many facelifts you get. And it's not that important. What's important is your integrity, your character. And what are you going, what gifts are you going to bring with you when you go into the next dimension? Because we're all going to get there sometimes. So you might as well shed your, your problems here and take the good stuff with you when you go. Yeah, and I'm not going to spend my last year trying to look good for men. <laughs> not happening <laughs> i can say you know i was a bit of a babe when i was young but that was a long time ago you know <laughs> and what did it get us what did it attract you know yeah i think I of, oh my gosh i mean i i was you know a nice looking young woman too once and i remember yeah. like, everywhere i went the heads would turn and i never yeah. liked it i felt like what am i a piece of meat I loved it. <laughs> did you? And I, I know people that did. Oh, they yeah, put their hair and laugh. And I think it's because I had been uh, raped as a teenager and had attempted rape on me before that. And I had a brother from time as, as long as I can remember when I was little, always trying to touch me. And so I never, to me, those looks meant rape. So I, I had to be very cautious and careful when yeah. very paranoid. And, and a blonde girl like you gets even more attention than. Well, I had dark brown hair. I actually look Indian, oh. you know. Without, oh. I started coloring as I got older. Okay. And then my grand, I go to color it back my natural. My grandkids wouldn't know me. <laughs> they said, "I said, do you like the brown or the blonde?" Instantly, the blonde. They didn't like the brown. Well, and then as I got older, I felt I looked depressed when I had brown hair. But that's just okay. me. But um. I do it myself. There's like, you know, six bucks a pop every couple months. So it's not like I'm going to a beautician. I cut my own hair. I mean, I never, I can't remember the last time I walked into a beauty shop. But, um, but yeah, I just, it's like, a, I just think about where we're going. Well, you know, Peg, I think that NDEers have something in common. A lot of us return with an intuition, an intuition about life, you know. I've uh, talked to other people, um, same situation. 
and they bring an intuition back. And I think, uh, you know, you've got to listen to your gut about things. Uh, it's helped me uh, sift through, you know, life uh, uh, a lot easier. Though I do think there is isolation that a, a near-death experience can bring. And I think there is one foot in, you're still there. Part of you is still there, at least psychologically. So I look at my near-death experience as a gift. I wish I could have skipped the broken nose and the massive bruises and the concussion, but um, I do it again. I get on the horse and do it all over again. You know, yeah, five years old. I mean, that drowning hurt. I've talked to into ears that drown. They didn't feel anything. I'm like, how did you not feel anything? I still remember that pain. And but when after I you know came to, I was my brother was carrying me over his shoulder, and I started coughing up water down his back, and he put me down, and my family went up to the the house and left me staying there, and I thought I had this knowledge now. My family doesn't love me. God sends children here to be loved. Why would I go up to that house? And I turned around to go back to the pond because I chose that. I thought, I feel like it's my life. It's my choice. And I, I thought, oh, man, it hurts. I know it's going to hurt, but I'm not going to fight it this time. I want to go back to what I was just doing. Mm -hmm. I didn't know the word suicide at five years old. No, no, it's very, very dramatic and, and traumatizing. I'm so sorry that you were not born into a family that could have appreciated you and cherished you because that's what every child deserves to be loved and cherished. Thank you. When that night, uh, you know, I went on up to the house and um, I won't go the whole thing. Everybody's heard my story too many times, but I realized that um, I was to love unloved children like me, that I would have an orphanage someday. And you have made a, a difference in. Yeah. I ended up having 60 fo therapeutic foster kids. We adopted 10. You know, I didn't put it together then, but that's why I'm doing this. You know, it was later um, when our last adopted, we had um, not adopted nine. My nephew was adopted right after my tubal, but um, and then, so there's eight girls and then a baby boy of wow. the adopted. And uh, for Christmas, we uh, fixed up the basement. It used to be a living room with a pool table and all that. We cleaned that out, painted it purple, flower border, got bought bunk beds, spent a fortune, not bunk beds, um, canopy beds and matching dressers. Oh, it made it beautiful. And I stood back to admire it. We got it all done. I was done by myself. And it dawned on me the night of that drowning that I got this revelation because I was looking at a storybook of old women living in the shoes, you know, yeah. these beds lined up. And it dawned on me, like my life was planned. Mm -hmm. And it just like, God, you're so funny. You, you, know? Realize, you, you connected it, you know. Uh, but I have to say another thing that I believe and that the, I drew from this as a conclusion. Um, there, it's The next world or the afterlife, there, it's a, a place of no time. That, that time is linear in physical reality, but not. And you think about it. Okay, think about, you know, you've seen on TV all of the multiverse they've got of that new telescope out. See how big that is, okay? How vast physical reality is. In the same space, but in a different dimension is where non-physical reality is. Just as vast, if you think about it. That gave you like an eye-opening experience seeing like, yeah, the Hummel pictures, and then you've got these new pictures, and so it's a big place out there. I just saw something the other day of AI, this artificial intelligence, yeah. where they're going to be able to, like, um, this telepathic communication. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't tell you, I can describe to you what it was. It was like telepathic communication. And like a show and scenes of what they're thinking. I'm like, oh, we were just talking about this on my show. Mm -hmm. I didn't, I said like, wouldn't that be cool if there was a technology? Because in heaven, those of us that have experienced these things, you know, we experience a telepathic communication. A lot of us, the visions open up. It could be a past uh, memory that will show us something in our NDE or something in the future. And, and like you say, the time is all different. And like now they're start. I said, you know, that's, you know, we think of God as ancient. 
I said, and it's, he's of now, but he's also futuristic. You know, they think the Bible that's old and nobody wants to do anything with that. It's so, you know, those people are crazy. They're just old fashioned. I said, no, God is so futuristic because we saw it in our NDEs, the way we were communicated with. And then I see this on, and I said, you know, we don't have that technology now. And then I see this on AI. We're going there. We are yeah. going there to that technology that we saw in heaven. The world is going faster and faster, you know. Uh, I remember when calculators, my sister got a calculator for college and it was like $60 and it was a big event and we opened it all up and it was like, oh, it's a calculator. Now you get them for three bucks and it's nothing. And it's this very strange, very fast world we're going to. I think that um, people that have a, a near-death experience are just so blessed to have the confidence when they die, we kind of know where we're going. I think it's such a blessing. And it doesn't um, mean we miss people any less that no, pass. I could not have faced, you know, you know, 29 surgeries in and out of hospitals all my adult life. I would have, I probably would have faced it and would have done it, but I wouldn't have done as well if I hadn't known. Because I didn't know this is it. You know, I didn't have this feeling, this is it. I know it's going to get better. Uh, it's just a, something I've got to get through. You know, and I've struggled with my purpose and all that. You do when you have a disease that is like the never ending story. Almost like, you know, you just lay back like, what next? You know, you just get that. You're so over it. Do you think we're at end times? No, no. I think there will be an end to this human beings on the earth because we're going to pollute ourselves to death eventually. But I don't think... If, I don't have those biblical thoughts. I mean, I was raised that way, went to Bible school, I sang in the choir, but I pro I pretty much let go, at least I think I've let go intellectually, of um, organized religion in general. You know, I've moved away from it because people are telling you the, your path to God. I've seen the path to the afterlife, so maybe I'm just on a, a different road, I don't know. Yeah, I kind of feel like I'm in a like religion by myself because I'm not new age and some of the Christians are so cruel and unaccepting. Oh um, yeah. Like I'm the devil because I might have somebody on that's had an experience that they think isn't of God. I'm not that person. I I allow people to tell their story how they want to tell it. Yeah. And I just want to hear the truth because I feel we can't yeah. investigate these things. We can't learn from these things if people have a gag or censored you know, right. I want people to go where they want to go and say what they want to say. I think that's really important. That's why I'm enjoying this show so much. You're just well, great. Thank you. And you've got a wonderful message that's positive and uplifting. Um, you're a lot nicer than I am. Uh, I'm a little oh, more. I'm oh, oh believe me, I can be bad. <laughs> more smug in general. I have my moments. If I'm hungry, if I've had too much sugar, if I've had too much caffeine. That's usually. I like a, I like a dirty joke and, a, you know, uh, um, things like that. But the, uh, I don't know, the comfort I draw from my near-death experience, it's like, okay, now I've seen a glimpse, kind of had a few seconds of reality. I can get through this. I can get through this physical life and jump the hurdles that I have to do. Um, I've always struggled, you know, what was my purpose in life? And um, I made, I've been good to animals. I mean, <laughs> written a few books, made a movie that's, you know, maybe that's, that's all there is. At least in this lifetime as Laura Catholic, I became aware of the afterlife. Maybe that's the, my only claim to fame or the only, you know, epiphany that I'll ever have. But I think it's a pretty good one. My first moment in the white light after the tunnel, when mm -hmm. I was still alone before I realized there was others there, I was thinking, oh my gosh, it's real. The whole God Bible, Jesus saying it's real because I wasn't in a casket. You know, I still existed. I knew I was yeah. dead. And I was like, it's real. It's real. It's real. Because that's the only place I ever heard of if, of an afterlife is yeah. through church. Right. So I was there. I was somewhere. I wasn't in Kansas anymore. You know, I, I was I, I, at Mary Morrow Hospital, Marietta, Ohio, and down in the wheelchair in that hallway. 
an emergency department. I was taken somewhere through space and I was in this white light and I looked down and there was no physical body and I existed. And I said out loud to God who I always just talk to, you know, either you're not in prayer, you just say things, you know, I didn't know he was sitting over there because I didn't see anything yet. But I was like, God, you got to send people back and tell them so we can tell them it's real. Not me, I didn't think. Like, you got to send people back, like send some people back enough to where they can tell people it's real. Because the Bible, I was thinking all and saying all this stuff, the Bible is old and outdated. And people aren't believing anymore or not reading anymore. And we need something new. Just, just let people know it's real. And then, you know, I started seeing this outline of people like, who's that? You know, and I forgot all about that. And then later, you know, like when I'm doing my show, I got, I say I pinched myself because that's what we're doing. You know, we're on here saying we were there. It's real. It may not fit in your Bible. It may not fit in your new age. It may not fit through your religion. But these, this is what this person experienced. Now, this is what this person experienced. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 And we it, can't put them in a box and all say, okay, this is all yeah. one thing now. They're all individual. And I look at them as like Christmas gifts. Like we're all passed out a different gift. We're not all given the same thing. We're all yeah. given what we need at the time. And what I got at five years old was very different when I got at 25. Well, you know, uh, I think a lot of people have a pinch of psychic after they come back from a near-death experience, but nobody's got a full cup. Right. You know, you're given little glimpses, little insights, things, strange coincidences, a little paranormal, but not a whole lot. You know, we've got to be cemented in this life. And, you know, the meaning of life is just turned upside down after a near-death experience. I think the thrill I got was how freaking good I felt when it happened. I mean, it felt like there's no... Cocaine would never even uh, come close to the elation. There's no drug. There's no accomplishment that feels as good as this does. So I think it's pretty cool. See, I didn't have, I didn't feel elation. You did. Yeah. Yeah. I, was I mean, I was just a kid having fun. Like I was getting this whole box of toys to play with, you know, because I can poof, I'm there, poof, I'm there. I can run here and do this. I can fly over the highway. It was just this box of toys. I was having fun. I like to hear. And I had no boss anymore. I had to go in, in a, a dark. I didn't have to eat my vegetables. You know, it was just that. Right. It was uh, kind of uh, funny because, you know, I, I was like screaming my brains out, you know, in my mind. And I don't know, you know, but I, I just, I felt like me. But my body was a luminous white. My hands, my arms, I could see was a luminous white, not, um, not color. So you had a form. I had a form. I felt like I was still me, psychologically and somewhat physically. But you know, in physical reality, I can't fly. And I just like zoomed and just rushed. And this vibration that comes over you is like tremendous buzz, like you want it back. So I guess that's why I got out of the car in the middle of the intersection. I was kind of embarrassed. My poor mother. Oh, geez. <laughs> you know, she kind of blamed it on the head injury. But then on the other part, when I when I actually told her, she understood more. And I know what you mean by that elation telling your mother, because I get that way. When I first started telling my husband, um, after being silent, you know, and burying it, thinking nobody's going to listen to me or believe me, I started telling him, and we'd be in our camper when he was working on jobs. And so I wasn't busy doing things, because I don't have a lot to do in his camper. And so when he was home, the poor guy, I would stand up in front of him. He's sitting in the recliner. He's got nowhere to go. <laughs> and I, I start talking about my NDEs and I would get all animated and excited. And, and I would try to hold back. And I'm looking at his expressions like, is he thinking I'm, and he never looked, gave me that face that we look for, the roll of the eyes, the pick the newspaper back up or all, okay, the, all those the, things. The, the, the like, Ugh, what I got from the doctor. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's funny. Now, I got to tell you a funny story. I mean, it's not funny, but I was at a relative's house. It's 1985. I'm going to go to sleep. And uh, I don't know. It was like 1130 at night. And all of a sudden, 
a deceased relative came into the bedroom. I jumped up like a mental patient with her <laughs> hair on fire, running through the house. Thank goodness I had a nightgown on. I'd have done it naked without. Uh, and, you know, just screaming like, oh, God, somebody in the family just died. <laughs> like, and then I had a family member, I won't say his name. He just said, calm me down. And I, I told him what happened and stuff. So the next morning I get up and I call my sister and said, okay, who died? Somebody in the family died. She goes, how did you know? We were just going to call you. Aunt Evelyn died. Oh, and she was so sweet. And I got up and I ran away from her, which wasn't my proudest moment. Um but I never felt that fear again when anything like that would happen. But I think that was just a little after effect or ability from my near death experience. And it is yeah. shocking. We don't uh, expect that stuff. Yeah, yeah I, I didn't take it well. Yeah, I didn't either. A lot of things that happened to me after yeah. my second day, I didn't, I didn't take well either. <laughs> or didn't I try to push it away? Knew I, everybody knew I was telling the truth because we didn't expect it. The poor woman, she was very sweet. She had. Alzheimer's and it was God's blessing that, you know, she passed, but, um, yeah, I feel kind of ashamed from running, you know, I'm screaming at the top of my lungs. And I mean, I don't think I ever moved so fast in my life to get out of that bedroom. Yeah. You feel like you're going crazy. Like you just lost, lost your mind. Like, am I crazy? No, I, I didn't feel like I did. that. I just felt scared <laughs> and shocked, you know, and, and, and scared. So I have a few things like that happen, but you know, I put it all in my books and it makes a good book and I don't worry about it after that. And it's nice to know that that will be here after we're gone, that somebody after we're gone can still hear our story. Yeah. And if people read, you know, my books, the near death connection, throw away horses, reincarnation connection in this in the near death saga book series, they're going to, you know, I always put some real truths in personal experiences into every book. Um, now you said they're 95% true. Is that what you said? The paranormal aspects of it. Now, the 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 who done it? The you know, if somebody gets murdered, that's all fiction. The characters are all fiction. But the paranormal experiences, the near death experience, the reincarnation experience is all ninety five percent factual. But I make the characters a little bit more dashing and attractive. <laughs> but yeah, and and plus I I write about the apprehension, what it feels step by step when you leave your body. When you look down at your body, when you're going through the tunnel, the things, you know, I really mapped it out, um, explained the layers or the dimensions in non-physical reality. I really go into great detail from my personal experience, but also from uh, some of the extensive research I've done. So I, it took me 10 years to write these three novels. So it wasn't uh, something I rushed. I wrote my book in three months. <laughs> When I had that vision that morning, I just grabbed my laptop and I just, I hardly slept or ate. Huh? Can I show you the cover? Sure. Okay. Can you see it? That is beautiful. I need a new cover. Mine's boring. That's nice. It's near death connection. And we put in the, the light um, and the tunnel and then the two gentlemen that are vying. It's a love triangle, you know, and all my characters are attractive, but I have characters that are older, you know, the parents are more interesting and everybody's got a backstory. Did you ever see the TV show Lost? Sounds familiar, but I don't know. It was a great show, but I really, everybody has a backstory and you get this group of uh, characters that this doctor uh, had documented about near death experience and they're in the book and they have this group and you've got an IRS agent that, that, uh, had a near-death experience when she had a reaction to a nut and a cookie and she's hysterically funny and they ask well how has she this really changed you and she goes well i wear pastels now <laughs> and then we've got this one character sharon landry you know she's trying to recount this this horrific thing that happened to her and she goes you know when you've done something bad something very bad you never get up that morning meaning to do it she's very very human but she has a near death experience as a child and it just changed her because she's got it from a, you know, a child's perspective and she's able to, you know, see ghosts and interact with them, but in a more realistic way, not Stephen Kingish. 
you know. Um, so I try to make these characters real and each person has a different type of near-death experience and how would a personality such as so-and-so react and everybody has a different way about it. Like, I thought I was really indoctrinated into the Presbyterian church, but I never really felt it because, you know, the Bible seems so ancient and, you know, pillar of salt stuff. So for me, when I, I was shown exactly what I needed to understand the afterlife and everybody as individual as we are, will have an individual near death experience that uh, differs in reaches or, or sings to them. Exactly. I believe. I agree. Well, it's been so nice. I don't want to take up your whole day. This has been, we've been here a long time. We really had a good conversation. So can I, um, you know, people can find me at lauracatch.com, L-U-R-A-K-E-T-C-H.com, or you can get my books at Amazon, Near Death Connection, and um, there's the series. And I've so enjoyed hearing your story. And I thank you for having me on the show. Thank you for coming. It's nice meeting you. Very nice to meet you, too. We've been Facebook friends for a long time. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.